Girl trafficking in Vietnam and other places in Southeast Asia, high dropout rates among minority students in U.S. high school, corruption in Ecuador, or um, even what we learned today about high unemployment rate among handicapped people here in Vietnam. What if I told you that there is an innovative approach to solve all this problem? And it's called the positive deviance approach. And it's based on the observation that solution to very complex problems like the one I just mentioned actually exist today, hidden in plain sight. And uh, actually, it all happened here in Vietnam some years ago. It was all started here. So dozens of books have been written about it. Students in university in the US and elsewhere have stud are studying it. Thesis, publication, and hundreds of articles have been written about it. But very few Vietnamese know about it. So I came here today to tell you what they all call the Vietnam story. I'm going to take you back in time. The year is 1990. How many of you were born before 1990? Aha, very few. So anyway, uh, so the year is 1990. The place is Hanoi, where my late husband, Jerry, our son, Sam, and myself had just arrived. We had been sent to Vietnam by an American uh, NGO, non-government organization, to work on, a, to develop a model for childhood nutrition in Vietnam. We were also the 13th, 14th, and 15th American in residence in Hanoi. Soon as, as soon as we arrived, the, the government official from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, called us in and said, you know, you are here, your mission here is to uh, develop a nutrition model for the whole country, but uh, we don't want you just to rehabilitate our malnourished children. We want you to keep them healthy. In other words, create a sustainable nutrition program. I know some of you, it sounds a bit difficult, but basically we had to create something that would remain and stick, as some of the people say. Well, and they added as an afterthought, by the way, Sterling, you have six months to show impact or your visa will not be renewed. <sighs> so, you should know that malnutrition is a very complex problem. It still kills about 2.6 million children every year worldwide. It's about five children per minute. So, to put it simply, during my talk, 60 children will die of it. Over 60% of the children were malnourished. And there are many causes to that. Of course, extreme poverty. Some of you may remember that. But uh, also the crippling decades-old US embargo, typhoon and floods that were recurring all the time. And also the switch from uh, collective farming to uh, individual farming with the doi moi uh, policy. And that left farmers in the countryside unable to really uh, produce food and feed their children. In the four villages that we were assigned, the situation was even worse. Uh, they were Nin, we were working in Tanhua province, and they were uh, n near famine situation. Uh, they didn't have enough rice to feed their children. And also, on top of that, when they heard that they would be working with Americans, they thought that we would shower them with dollars. And on top of that, they were also very suspicious of our intentions, since all they knew about American is their bomb during the American war. We, the Sternins, actually didn't have time to set up an office, to hire staff, to get supplies. We, of course, didn't know the language, didn't know anything about rural Vietnam. And 
worst of all, we were not even nutritionists, so not experts. So, what were you we to do? So we looked in, in an impossible situation, we looked for existing resources. And we soon realized, going to Tanhua, uh, that the commune we work with had that the people were very literate, that they were very easy to, uh, uh, to, to mobilize, that there were institutions locally, there were the People's Committee, the Women's Union at Hamlet level, and some health staff. So basically, we asked them to do something they'd never done before. We said, could you work together to try to, to rehabilitate to your, your malnourished children? And they say yes. So in other words, we capitalized on communism. And the first thing we did with them is uh, they, they did a survey to weigh all their children in the street to assess the situation. The good news is that they were able to weigh over 2,000 children with only three scales in four days. That was, that's the Vietnamese way. Powerful. The very sad news is that 68% of their children were malnourished, with half of them in danger of dying. Now, a month had passed, the clock was ticking, we had, we had only five months to show impact. So what to do? We had read about nutrition study in positive deviance, where researchers explore the factors that enable very poor family to have well-nourished children in community with high level of malnutrition. Could we find those poor family, very poor family, with healthy children in those communes? The answer was there, hidden in plain sight. So what we did is after the leaders of each commune shared the heartbreaking findings from the survey. We turned to the women's union volunteer and we asked them, looking at your list, can you find ch healthy children who belong to very poor family? They looked and looked, and then one said, call, call. Another one said, Ko? We said, you mean it's possible today in this village for a poor, poor family to have a healthy child? They went back on their list and this time with excitement said, yes, yes. So we said, let's go and find out what they're doing. And of course, so the secrets of these families, some of the secrets of this family lay in the rice paddies. What they, what they were doing is they were feeding their very young children shrimps or crab or snails that were easily available in the rice paddies. And they also, uh, these, are, these are very nutritious food, protein-rich food that were considered hot food and unsuitable for young children. There were other uncommon behaviors, such as uh, feeding their children three or four times a day instead of twice a day. That was the custom. Everybody at that time ate only twice a day. And there were other uh, behaviors, such as washing hands before and after eating. And so, with all these results, what was to be done next? Traditionally, you teach people what to do. The pro we can use propaganda, the loudspeaker in Vietnamese village, to tell people what to do. We've got the answer. It's right there. But some volunteers said, you know, we tell people what to do, but they don't do it. You know, knowledge doesn't change behavior, necessarily. So one woman came up with this old Vietnamese saying, a southern hearing is not worth one seeing, and a thousand thing is not what one doing. So what did they do? The villagers decided then to develop a nutrition uh, program that, was, that would enable the people with the malnourished children to actually practice those simple behavior. 
Uh, and so they set up a nutrition session where families would bring their children and cook and uh, feed their children all together. But there was a catch. To participate in this program, the families had to bring food, you know, against the traditional program, which is bringing uh, uh, imported food. They had to bring food. And you guess what the food was? The shrimps and crabs or snails that was uh, available in the rice paddies. And uh, they did this. These were simple, inexpensive solution, easy to adopt because they were practiced by people who were just like them. And it, it worked. So three months after six months, the government sent a health team to the villages to check on the program. They discovered that, oh and behold, 40% of the children had been rehabilitated by the community. So we got our visa renewed for another year. Thank you. And the following year, over a thousand children were rehabilitated and stayed healthy because people had learned what they learned together in so session, they were able to replicate and practice at home. Not only that, but the Tenwa model or the PD Heart model in nutrition has been exported and has been used in hundreds of communities in more than 40 countries around the world. And it all started here. But that, it doesn't stop there. Yeah, it's like, you should thank yourselves. What I want to say is it's important to go back to your roots and find inner solutions. But it didn't stop there. The PD approach was developed based on the lesson learned from Vietnam and later on in Egypt. And the concept is very simple. I said it before, solution to very complex problem uh, already exist. They have been developed by people least likely to succeed. And these people with very little resources, we call them the positive deviants. They are in US hospital, the front workers who day in and out prevent hospital infection with simple strategy that beat the expert in infection control. Or they are in Lebanon, where I work, uh, Syrian refugee communities where very few girls uh, manage to finish high school. You see some of them. There are also uh, that picture in this. Most girls don't finish elementary school because they, they're too poor. They have to help their families. But there are some girls who do go to school from the very poorest family. What can be learned from them? So the how it works, the approach works by inviting communities and organizations to identify a specific problem that they want to solve, identify the PDs in their midst, and then discover their successful uh, strategies and uh, behaviors, and then spread that um, leverage or spread this to others who learn to practice them. And, uh, this promotes behavior and social change through that process. What makes it work? You need skill facilitation, where you learn to listen and to display empathy, where you use emotional intelligence. You also try to create a safe space for people who never sat together before, sit and talk to each other. It also required a role reversal from the, the, the leadership. It requires from expert to become non-expert, to find the solution in the, in the people. It requires teachers and professors to become students and leaders to become catalysts from, for bottom-up change. And that's not easy. That's the hard part, because people with power and control want to stay there. So the approach has been used in many, many fields, has been used uh, in um, 
issue regarding HIV AIDS and some gender equity issues as well. But what do you think it could be used for is up to you. I, we heard some of the issues this morning uh, that it could be applied to. And there are some issues I've spoken to people here in Hanoi while I'm here who said, for instance, there's a big social issues on gender preference for boys, apparently, that maybe you could, this approach could be used. Anyway, it's up to you. You can start, yeah. you can start now, and uh, next time you encounter a non a technical problem, instead of looking for outside help, think shrimps and crabs and snails and look for solutions that are already right there in front of you. Thank you. Thank you.